This Paban comes from my new book, um, The Grade 2 Repertoire Lessons. Um, this is a follow-up to the Grade 1 Repertoire Lessons, which follows my method books. And uh, there's a link for that underneath the video, but watch the videos for free. You might have these pieces in other books, um, very likely actually. Um, but my book goes through a couple of little ideas for the piece, and then um, just to kind of prepare you for the piece. Now in the first book, we often played the melody on its own. We played the chord shapes. We explored the rhythm of the piece. In this book, we're going to look a little bit more carefully at um, the techniques used in pieces. Um, we'll also take a look at fingering choices, so um, why we choose certain fingering. Um, so it's going to be a little bit, little bit different. And now the, the level requirement is just a little tiny bit harder than grade one, but not really. It's almost the same level, but some new ideas are introduced later on, such as ornamentation and things like that. So this pavan, the first thing I would do is just play the melody on its own. Those are the notes with stems going up. So um, just to do the first line here. You know, you want a little bit of shaping. Not just like... So you want it to be very nice and legato, a little bit of um, dynamic shaping in there. Um, now, so that's the first thing I would do is just play that melody on its own. Um, and the other thing you can do is play a scale in the key of the piece to prepare you for the key signature. In this case, it's A minor, so we'll just play one scale in this case, an A melodic minor scale. That's on the first um, page of the lessons for this piece. So um, playing in the, a scale in the key of the piece really prepares you to play in the piece. Um, this piece has lots of accidentals, so I went with the melodic minor scale. Other pieces we're going to do all, you know, a whole bunch of minor scales. But a, a basic melodic minor scale gives you most of the notes for this piece. Now, one of the reasons I included this piece in grade two and not grade one um, just was because in grade one, I avoided some, some little stretches. Um, this piece is pretty easy. It's the first piece in the book. I wanted it to be just a nice introduction to the book and a nice piece to play. Um, but I want to be a little bit more picky with you this time on how you play the pieces. So let's take a little section here. Um, we're going to take a little section of the piece. And this part here is just from bar two and bar three. This is where we have a G in the bass. Students often have a trouble holding this third finger on a low bass note while getting other notes around it. So I want you to be very picky in this particular spot. And I've written out these two bars on their own with arrows telling you to hold the bass notes so to keep your third finger down. So it's just very important that we um, practice and just remember to like be very, you know, really careful that we're sustaining notes for their proper note values while maneuvering our fingers to do all the other things. It's one of the best things about um, classical guitars. We play more than one voice at a time, but we have, along with that comes the responsibility to actually like play the notes of each voice. You know, you can think of it as like a horizontal thing where there's two voices going and to sustain each one independently of the other, to make sure that we're doing both voices justice. Um, another little section would be bar nine. So keeping our third finger on C. stretch between three and four often in this particular case. Um, at the bottom of the page I've also written a small exercise where we go through one, two, four on every string while keeping the third finger down. So let me repeat that. We're going to keep our third finger on low G but then play one, two, four on every string. So we play the open string and, and the low note together. Doesn't sound good but If 
If you find that G sharp a little too difficult on the first string, just um, play G natural if you have to. It's good practice to play the G sharp though, to just get used to that thing. It's gonna come up in every piece you play from now on pretty much, like these kinds of stretches. So this is a great opportunity just to get over it and to get used to it, to make sure you have it down. One thing I'll say is that sometimes students, if they're holding their guitar wrong, they have a hard time doing that. Like if I held my guitar like this, I can't reach the G sharp. If I go a little bit more vertical and play close to the frets and everything, G sharp's no problem. So like bad guitar positions are usually the cause of not being able to reach stretches in basic repertoire. Because we're not talking about crazy stretches here, we're talking about basic guitar playing, like the requirements of playing guitar. So if you can't reach it, remember I have very small hands, I can reach that, I can probably reach beyond that. Um, it's because of my guitar position and my relaxation. So those two things in combination, like good pos hand position, sorry, good hand position, good guitar position, a little bit of relaxation, you can reach all the basic shapes in guitar. But I've seen students with bad guitar positions struggle away trying to stretch their fingers um, to, to no um, a successful result. So this piece is a great opportunity to, just to make sure once and for all that you, you can handle that stretch on its own. By the way, this is lute repertoire, this first piece. Um, and so the F sharp would sharp would normally be an open string in lute, but it isn't here. Now, in the next grade level, grade three, I will be introducing um, tuning down the third string but to, so we can play lute music, but let's not do that yet. In this particular piece, this is a, there's not many F sharps and it's a great opportunity to work on your technique, so we're going to play it in normal guitar tuning. That's kind of all I have to say for the first piece, um, but like I said, play the melody on its own. Sorry. Um, to, to get your shaping really beautiful without the bass notes, then when you add the bass notes, shape just as beautifully. Um, practice any chord shapes that are difficult. So uh, we kind of already did that a little bit like... Making sure like they all feel good um, from a technical perspective and that you can get them without thinking too much. Um, and then um, explore any of the rhythms. The rhythms in this piece are pretty easy because it's just eighth notes, although you do have that ba strange bass note thing in bar six. Um, but, but that's not too difficult, you just have to make sure you know that it's there. Um, so besides that, um, I don't think I have anything else to say. Let's just do a quick walkthrough of the piece and then, and then we'll move on to the next piece. Just do some shaping. Just I am fingering on the top voice. I start with M. M, I, 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 M. And don't emphasize that low D too much in the end of bar two, just kind of breeze through it nicely. There's that F sharp, so just make sure you're sustaining the bass. Hold your bass, double. You have a second position there, so just be a little bit careful. When, when you go into second position, make sure you move your whole hand up, including your thumb. So you just move your hand right into second position. That way you can just reach everything right off the bat without having to, to stretch or outreach. And if you're having trouble with that, remember to swing your knuckle around so that you can get all those four frets very easily. This last little E major chord, a little bit of excitement and then back way off and like decrescendo. Because it, it, it's, not, it's not really musical content, it's just a chord that's kind of unraveling. It's just like, just like, just brush that string very lightly on the last chord. Then you're into C major for a bit. A little bit more cheerful. holding the bass notes through there. 
there. Just remember to keep your C's down and then your G's down. Watch out for your sharps in the last line. A major. Pieces would often like start in a minor key and then the last chord would be a major. Um, you can call it a Picardy third, but like you don't have to. Um, in the Renaissance, it's just like a, it's a way of just ending the piece in a more cheerful manner. So. Uh, make sure that you realize that that's an A major at the end. It's not a typo or anything like that. Pieces in minor keys can just end with a major chord. It's it's similar. It's a very similar key, and it just like changes the flavor. It's almost like a little happy surprise at the end of the piece. Um, not much else to say. So enjoy that piece, and then we'll be moving on to more classically oriented, uh, classical era works.